Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for this legislative press conference. I'm Bailey Carlson, Director of Constituent Services for the Governor's Office. Just a reminder to those on the phones that you can mute your lines by pressing star six and unmute during the Q&A by pressing the pound sign and then six again. Also for those in the room, please turn on your mics at the table when you have a question. Now I'll turn it over to Governor Dugard. Thank you, Bailey, and thank you everyone for joining this uh, press conference. I've got three things I wanted to uh, begin with. First, I will not be here next week uh, at the press conference. I'll be at the National Governors Association winter meeting in Washington, D.C., and the lieutenant governor will be here in my place, so um, you can expect that. Secondly, uh, we had uh, the Joint Appropriations Committee has met and adopted the revenue projection that will confine spending for fiscal year 19 and I'm very pleased with uh, the adopted number they chose. I think it represents a fair compromise between the two projections by the Bureau of Finance and Management and the Legislative Research Council which were pretty close together to begin with. So I think that uh, gives us hope that the revenue will actually come in uh, somewhere between those two numbers and that we'll be able to maintain our spending within revenue. Um, the other thing, the third thing, we've been having conversations with veterans groups about a veteran cemetery. That's an issue that's um, uh, becoming, uh, that's being discussed here more recently in the legislative halls. Um, we are, in fact, we even had uh, meetings today to try to agree upon what the uh, revenue will be from such a cemetery and what, sh what the costs will be and to the extent that costs will exceed revenue streams, what sort of an annual expense would be, uh, need, would need to be covered. And, um, so I'm hopeful that we can find common ground on that and agree upon those numbers, and that would be the responsible approach to, to moving ahead. Uh, with that, I will open it up for questions on any topic. Well, I think it's certainly uh, a step a school can take. I think it's noteworthy that in some of the reports I read about the Florida shooting, there were law enforcement officers present at the school at the time, is what I'm told. Now, if that's accurate or not, I'm presuming it is. So the presence of a Sentinel uh, may or may not have an impact on such an incident in South Dakota. But certainly it's an option that is available to local school districts and it's something I know at least one school district has utilized and maybe others that I'm not aware of. Yeah, the amount of uh, an endowment that would support the need that would uh, be created by the existence of such a cemetery, it's hard to judge. You can't judge what the endowment should be until you understand what the income stream would need to be. What is the, the net cost per year? And you can back into an endowment if you at, uh, when I was at Children's Home Society, we assumed a, an endowment return of 4.5%. Uh, all our uh, endowments uh, or quasi-endowments in the form of trust funds, like our Educational Enhancement Trust Fund and our Cement Plant Trust Fund and our Health uh, Trust Fund, all, I think, assume a 4% rate 
of uh, distribution. I think a lot of large endowments at universities assume a four to five percent distribution rate. And so I would say whatever the income stream is, uh, divide that by four percent and or whatever the income net, the needed income for the cemetery would be from an endowment, divide that by four percent and you'll know what an appropriate endowment should be. Uh, again, I think we are having conversations with the veterans groups that are in support of this and we all need to agree upon what is the cost. I know our, our uh, Bureau of Finance and Management people at my request have been talking to other similar cemeteries in surrounding states to try and understand from their experience what, how many people were buried, will be buried there, what a burial costs, what kind of revenue uh, comes from the federal government in each case, what kind of costs are generated by fixed costs of the cemetery, by variable costs that grow with each uh, burial, those kinds of things. And so I think if everyone sits down and looks at all the information and together agrees upon what seems to be reasonable for our situation, uh, then at that point we know either is that money going to come from a general appropriation every year? Is that money going to come from an endowment distribution? Is it coming from a mix? That sort of thing is what the Appropriations Committee needs to know, and I think the, the parties are working toward that information. Well, I know the parties are talking. I know the microbreweries and the distributors are talking. Um, I continue to think the bill that we've offered is uh, a reasonable uh, plan. It uh, acknowledges the ongoing uh, three-tier system uh, for the most part. It provides an exception for a little higher production by microbreweries in South Dakota, still uh, a fair amount below what our surrounding states allow. So I don't know if one could say that we're taking any extreme steps there. And in terms of the self-distribution, that will be, I think, again, um, the those that uh, oppose the microbrewers don't want any self-distribution allowed at least as, as I understand the current bill form, and our bill would allow some self-distribution by those microbrewers, which I think is fair and appropriate. So uh, we'll see where it goes. I was just going to ask about the 14th Constitutional Amendment. Did you weigh in on that? I haven't weighed in on that. Uh, I would say it's a, it's a different uh, gaming, uh, destination gaming is a different animal today than it was when Deadwood uh, passed a constitutional amendment. Back in those days, uh, there were very few destination gaming opportunities around the country. And then since the advent of Indian gaming and the advent of uh, states allowing multiple locations for gaming, even outside reservations. Uh, I'd say destination gaming is almost everywhere. And so I don't have any strong feelings about it one way or the other. Uh, it's not an issue upon which the governor will have a vote, except in the ballot, uh, on the ballot. Otherwise, those joint uh, resolutions are passed by the two houses and then go straight to the voters. I don't veto or vote for or against it. In the past, those three groups have been treated similarly in terms of the percentage. Uh, 
historically, I would say prior to the past several years, uh, we've looked at an inflation factor for Medicaid providers that is prospective. In other words, what our economists projecting inflation will be and that inflator has been applied to their rates and um, so a prospective inflation rate in the education world that uh, judgment is in statute and it's a uh, retrospective look at what inflation has been and the inflation factor is then applied or three percent whichever is less and in recent years of low unemployment or low inflation, it's always been less. And so last year, for example, that rate uh, retrospectively was six tenths of one percent. This year, I, I honestly can't recall what it was because we didn't have anything as far as our revenue projections were in December. So I'm not sure what the what the statutory inflation rate is. Regardless. In the last several years, when the legislature had money, they'd, they'd made a uniform percentage, pretty much, I would say. The revenue projection that was adopted uh, is about $19 million, almost $19 million more than I had estimated we'd have available when I made the projection in the budget address in December. If you gave 1% to each of those three groups, it cost something around $15 million. So if you've got 19 million more and you want to do 1% for everyone, and again, I don't presume to know what the legislature will do. I think they're cognizant of the fact that employees went without a raise last year. The six tenths of 1% that was would have been allocable to raises was spent on health insurance costs. And so the paychecks of our employees stayed the same. And I know that they were cognizant that my budget proposal was to leave them the same leave them the same for a second year in a row and I think they're hoping to uh, avoid that so yeah, I'm hopeful that each of the three groups will will be considered whether they'll be treated equally or uh, disproportionately one over the other I don't know yet Yeah, I still don't think it has um, any real economic opportunity. I think, uh, as I recall, if one if a state passes a law allowing for industrial hemp, you still have to get authority from the federal government to experiment with it. And I think beyond that, you can't do more. And I don't know that any of the experiments have proven to be uh, profitable. I might be wrong about that, but I'm, I'm very skeptical. You, know, you can go to uh, some states where marijuana is legal and go to shops where you can buy hemp clothing and hemp cloth and things like that. But outside of that very narrow market, I wonder if a significant production of hemp would destroy that market. Because, I, again, maybe I'm wrong about that, but right now I just don't see it as uh, as having any significant impact on agriculture certainly wouldn't have profitability when you all you can do is experiment with it with a federal permit turn it over to the phones if there's any questions on the phones okay back to the room Uh, I don't have any newer information on the work requirement. I know Kentucky's waiver has been approved. I know we've gotten some guidance since my budget speech when we talked about uh, creating a work requirement. Uh, but that guidance was fairly close, if not exactly, uh, in the areas where we were planning to go. So I didn't see anything in the guidance that would prevent us or change the approach we are planning to take. I'll be in Washington, D.C. at NGA, and I am going to meet with 
um, the new uh, Health and Human Services Secretary while I'm there, and I'm going to mention the fact it's mostly a relationship building meeting, although coincidentally, coincidentally the new Health and Human Secretary, uh, when he was a leader at uh, was it Eli Lilly, I think, um, came to South Dakota to our pheasant hunt because one of their subsidiaries uh, was considering a South Dakota location. And so I've got a picture of uh, the new secretary and myself uh, with a pheasant that we shot, or he shot, I think he shot it. Um, so uh, I have met him already and I'll, I'll be glad to meet him again and I'm gonna raise the work requirement and mention it, that it'll be coming and that we're hopeful he'll give it favorable consideration. I have no reason to, to believe otherwise because it will be within the guidelines that Medicaid has already issued. I also note, though, that some states have already filed suit against the federal government, alleging that the statute uh, does not permit work. It's not as uh, loosely written as some other entitlement programs that have been interpreted to allow a work requirement. So we'll see where that goes. have not looked at it or read it um, I've read a story about it in the newspaper and uh, probably I'll look at the testimony pro and con before acting on it uh, Yes, I think uh, I think we had we saw some unintended consequences from Marcy's law. We saw costs that the counties did not expect being imposed upon them. We saw uh, some inability to investigate some accidents and other kinds of incidents that I don't think would cause anyone to say was an intent of the law. Um, and I think the uh, sponsors of Marcy's Law recognized that they uh, that there were some unintended consequences and did not want uh, to see that measure overturned in the Constitution or removed from the Constitution or changed substantially without their involvement and so then it's my understanding they engaged with the speaker and have been visiting with the speaker and they've come to some agreement. And uh, that's, that's the way law should be made at the outset, in my mind, rather than something uh, substantial and detailed placed into a constitution and having those unintended consequences exist for two years. That's why things like that should be in law, not in the constitution. No, we haven't. Uh, I do think it is a defensible, I'm not a constitutional law, lawyer by any means, but I think it's defensible. I do, uh, I look at it the same way at the federal level. We don't allow foreign governments to influence legislation or to contribute to, uh, I should say, they may influence legislation, but they don't, they can't contribute uh, to candidates, um, so if you if you don't allow foreign governments to be involved in election matters in our nation, why should foreign states or foreign uh, 
state citizens have an influence on laws that don't apply to them and never will. So I think an argument can reasonably be made that this sort of limitation is defensible under the Constitution. I do. I think it's definitely worth it. You see the increasing activism of out-of-state interests and their willingness, it seems, every election now to bring something they're interested in, again, that does not impact them because they live out-of-state or they do business out-of-state and use South Dakota as their, uh, their uh, experiment. So I do think it's worth pushing back against that and reminding them that the initiated measure process was established to allow our own state citizens to rise up and place something on the ballot themselves and not have some outsider pay a, a petition circulator to obtain signatures, which are easily given, and uh, get something on the ballot and then spend millions of dollars to influence the attitudes of voters about pages and pages and pages of either laws or constitutional amendments. Uh, it's just a, it's, it's so far from the intent of the framers of that initiate measure process, I'm sure. Anything else? Do you want to share with us? I don't think so. Thank you very much. Thank you.